Number two, you do as Joseph said, you adjust. Amen to that. And so that was just beautiful without the accompaniment. Yeah. And so when those things happen, you can do one of two things. You can get worked up, or you can go on. Amen. We go on around here. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Number three, isn't it great to see the discipling of young people? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And help them to grow and serve the Lord. Yeah. So that was just wonderful. Was Amen. Thank you. And, uh, and thank you to our tech folks. I know that that was not their plan for all that yeah. to happen today. And they work so hard and so often it was so good. Just sometimes it happens. And, uh, yeah, amen. Amen. So thank you. And, you know, I need to say as well, thank you to those who, who put our online ministry on. And for the many who watch our online ministry, we appreciate that. Though you're not here with us in the sanctuary, we're thankful. When you attend our services and share, yes. you are part of our church family as far as we're concerned. Yes. And so we thank the Lord for you. All right. Well, let's take our Bibles this morning, and I'd like you to turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament, the second half of the Bible. Matthew 21. And we're going to read about what's called the triumphal entry, or the beginning of Holy Week. Or Palm Sunday, when Jesus enters Jerusalem just days before his crucifixion. And I'm going to begin, going to begin reading in verse 1. Matthew 21 and verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, and that's they, the disciples and Jesus, and came to Bethphage to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And that colt, by the way, is not a horse. It's a younger donkey. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put, their cloaks, uh, and put on their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees, palm branches, and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. This is again what is called the triumphal entry. And I have to be honest with you. As I've read and studied this through the years, I've been puzzled. And the puzzling that I have is this. Jesus already knows this week is going to end in him being killed, crucified. So why, knowing that, does he participate in this public parade of praise? When some in this crowd who are cheering him will soon be calling, crucify him. You see, if you study the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, again chapter 17, again chapter 20, in all three of those chapters, Jesus has already publicly acknowledged to his disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. Remember, we studied last week the transfiguration. And Moses and Elijah appeared to him to talk to him about his upcoming death. He knows it's coming. And yet he participates in this parade. 
as they're praising him and crying out Hosanna. In our day and time, Hosanna has kind of come to mean a, a, a statement of praise to the Lord, like a hallelujah. But in that day, it literally meant God save or save us. And so they're looking to Jesus like a king to come in, throw off Roman rule and set the Jewish people free. Why would he participate knowing what's coming in just about five days? What is the purpose? As I study the scriptures, let me share three thoughts on the purpose. The first is what I would call prophecy fulfilled. You see, the Bible says in this text that Zechariah the prophet had said that your king is going to come riding on a donkey. And here he is doing that. And Matthew says this is the fulfillment of this prophecy. Matthew is believed to have written his gospel account primarily to the Jewish people. And so over and over again, he appeals to them that Jesus is fulfilling Old Testament prophecies. Because so many of the Jews respected and believed in the Old Testament. And by the way, sometimes people in our day say, well, you know, I like to study the Bible or go to a Bible study, but I don't want to study about the Old Testament. That's old stuff. Now, wait a minute. If you're going to study the New Testament, the second half of the Bible, it is well for you to know the Old Testament, the first half of the Bible. Matthew, 12 times in his gospel, says it is fulfilled. Referring back to Old Testament predictions or prophecies. Nine times he says it is written. Referring back to Old Testament scriptures. And so Jesus has the purpose in this parade of fulfilling the prophecy. The Bible says the king would come. And he would be riding on a donkey, and Jerusalem was to praise and celebrate. So this is a purpose which fulfills. And again, if you're going to be a student of the Bible, you need to know what's in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Or at least have an appreciation for it. Not put it down, not avoid it, learn more about it. Prophecy fulfilled. Number two, presentation of the King. Remember the hymn we sang, and the king? You see, the Lord Jesus has always been identified in the scriptures as a king. You go clear back to the psalm we read in our responsive reading from Psalm 24. It says, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. That is an Old Testament reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember at Christmas time we read from Isaiah that unto us a son is given, unto us a child is born, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And the government won't end, and he shall sit upon the throne, kings do that, of his father David, and shall establish his kingdom. He's a king, Old Testament. Come to the New Testament. We celebrate again at Christmas the wise men, and they came to Herod and said what, Matthew 2? They said, where is he who is born King of the Jews. Pilate asks him at his trial, which will take place during this holy week, about Wednesday or Thursday. And he said to Jesus, are you a king? And Jesus said, my kingdom, kings have kingdoms. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Otherwise, my servants would rise up and fight. You see, and then there's coming a day, Revelation chapter 21, or chapter 19, verse 21, the Lord Jesus is going to come back. This is a church right here that believes in the second coming of Jesus Christ. That we believe he came the first time, we believe he's coming back. And the Bible says when he does come back, He'll be riding a white horse and on his thigh. I don't know if it's imprinted on his thigh. I don't know if it's a band around his thigh. But it declares he is king of kings and lord of lords. And the idea there is a king. You see, we have presidents. And our presidents have a lot of authority. But they don't have all authority. Kings, even today in many countries, really don't have that much authority. 
They're more of a figurehead. But in this day and time when the Bible is written, the king had in his mouth the law of life and death. He could let you live. He could make you die. He could bless you or he could curse you. The king had absolute authority. And the Lord Jesus Christ as the absolute authority is the king over all kings that have ever been or ever will be. You see, he is the king of kings. But when he comes into Jerusalem, he's riding on a donkey. You know why? Because the donkey was not the animal for war. It was the animal for peace. When he comes back to make war against the evil one and the wicked, he will ride the horse. But when he comes into Jerusalem, he comes in as the king of peace. The prince of peace. Because his kingdom at that point and even now is not about Christians going out and taking over other countries. It's not about Christians forcing people to confess Christ or get killed or persecuted. It's about sharing the love of God in our hearts that has been spread upon, brought by the Holy Spirit within us when we have believed in the Lord Jesus as our Savior. It has been well said. Do you want the peace of God in your heart and life? Yes. Then you must start with peace with God. Amen. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. We have peace with God. You see, until we're saved, it's as though God is our judge. We are the enemy. We are in sin. And yet when Jesus gives us forgiveness, we are reconciled to God. We're at peace with God. Then we can say, dear Lord, would you put peace in my heart? Philippians chapter 4. Even when you're going through a trial, the Bible says, don't get worked up. Pray. And the peace of God. And even if you are worked up, pray. And the peace of God can settle our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Peace with God. Peace of God. The Lord Jesus came in this presentation as the King of Peace. Not a kingdom of the world over a country or a tribe or a nation or a people, but King of the hearts. There's an old hymn that says, King of my life. I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Many of you have probably heard of the gospel ministry called Campus Crusade. And they have a gospel tract entitled The Four Spiritual Laws. And in that they picture a chair and they call it a throne. And they said that throne either has a big S on it or a big C on it. If it's an S, that means because you are ruling your own life yourself. In the sense, you decide what you want. And you're trying to give direction to yourself. The big C is when you ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. And he sits on the throne. And then remember the king with the absolute authority. When the king wants you to do something, you do it. When the king doesn't want you to do it, you don't. That's what it is. The presentation of the king. The prophet said, your king is coming. And so Amen that's what that. happened. Yes. The third and final purpose, as I see it, is simply this, praise. Mm -hmm. The Bible says Jesus comes into the city sitting on the donkey. They throw their cloaks on the road. You know, that is the donkey is at least the red carpet treatment, if you will. And then they take the palm branches, they lay them on the road also to make a cushion, or they're waving them. And by the way, in heaven, the Bible says saints will be waving the palms as well, Revelation. And then they're crying out, Hosanna! 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 Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. They're praising him. And some of the quote unquote spiritual leaders said, you know, we don't all of the shouting and carrying on in the name of religion. Come on. It kind of reminds me of that fellow that came to the Lord. He was so blessed to be forgiven and so blessed to be saved. And he just started shouting and praising God. And one of the church leaders said, Hey, we don't act like that in our church. Yeah. He said, But brother, I got religion. He said, Well, you didn't get it here. <laughs> Some of the leaders came and said, Teacher, stop 
your disciples from all this yelling. You know what Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke? He said, if they don't praise me, the very stones will cry out. Now what does that mean? Can God make a stone cry out? I think he can because he made a rock in water. But I think more important, as many Bible teachers I study have said, it's not that God was going to make rocks crowd. It was just Jesus was saying, you can't stop this. <laughs> They're going to praise me. Right. They are absolutely going to praise me. Amen. Now, the Bible does use rocks and mountains in a beautiful way to speak of praise. Uh, Psalm 148, verse 9, sun, moon, stars, praise him. Mountains, praise him. Hills, praise him. I mean, we sing that at Christmas time, don't we? Joy to the world, heaven and nature sing. Yes. Yes. But along with that, not only the praise symbolically from the rocks, but the idea of Jesus said, you are not going to stop this praise. Apparently, the heavenly Father determined before he went to the cross, his son would be exalted. His son would be praised. And the crowd is crying out in praise to Jesus and honoring him. He deserved it. And you know, as I read that and thought about that, I thought about a time that is yet to come. When the Bible says he will be praised and exalted again. Amen to that. It's in the book of Philippians in chapter 2. Therefore God has highly exalted him. And given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Every tongue should confess. Those in heaven. Those on earth. Even those under the earth. Everyone at some point in the future will bow down and will confess Jesus is Lord. It won't matter if in this life you cursed Him or you didn't believe Him or you mocked Him. Friend, in that day you will confess Jesus is Lord. The thing I say to people is this. Do it now because it's salvation. You do it then, it is purely submission. But either way, Jesus Christ will be praised. You can't stop it. That's the idea. David said, seven times a day, I praise you. Amen. You know what praise is? It's admiring. It's approving. It's adoring and expressing. Now, you won't believe this about me because I look so young. <laughs> but I'm a grandfather of three boys, three, oh, three grandchildren. God bless. And particularly the younger two, both are sons to my two sons, I'm always getting videos <laughs> or text pictures <laughs> or phone calls. Guess what they did today? Guess how they look today. Guess what happened today. And it's so exciting. And it's so wonderful. Now the funny thing is, I've noticed my 20 year old, they're not telling me much about him. You know, <laughs> as you get older, maybe that's part of it. But these younger guys, wow, they love to express how wonderful they are. Let me tell you something, dear Christian. You and I ought to consistently be able to express how good and how great our God is. That is praise. But I want to say this to you. I learned a powerful lesson. Hey, all my friends that were in heaven, you remember Brother Jerry Zeal's friend? We were sitting in a staff meeting one day and they served something that I rarely eat called a donut. <laughs> Now I'm lying because you know I love donuts. But man, I, I took that donut and stupid me. I said, oh boy, this donut is a blessing. <laughs> and Brother Jerry said, I think blessing <laughs> probably is a little deeper than a donut. <laughs> and as I shrunk under the table, no. I still took a bite of my donut. <laughs> but but I <laughs> Brother, you're right. So since then, I've tried to weigh a little more what I call something or someone a blessing. 
You know, sometimes tritely in church speak, we say, oh, PTL, or praise the Lord. I mean, we might, oh, my tennis shoe's untied. Well, I gotta tie praise the Lord. <laughs> okay, if you're legitimately praising the Lord. But my point is this. Don't just make it a trite statement. Make it a reality. Amen to I'm truly admiring you. I'm truly affirming you. I'm truly adoring you. Yes. You are great and you are good. Amen. And you are God. Amen. Amen to that was happening on that day. Jesus was giving deserved praise. Amen. Yes, there are sad days ahead. But today, Hosanna! Hallelujah! Praise the Lord. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing that song again, Gene. 131. I want you to just lift it up.